going to be talking today about some of the modern steps, some of the, the new things that have been developed in mushroom cultivation. Uh, most of what you hear has to do with yesterday's techniques. I've been doing this for about 45 years now. I own several of my own farms. I've owned a number of farms over the years, grown all kinds of mushrooms. So I wanted to share some of the developments that we've made over the years. I want to talk first about cold sterilization technique. This is really a paradigm shift from where we've been at in the mushroom industry. It is integrating modern biotechnology with traditional agriculture. And it's very cost effective. It doesn't take much money to set up a cold farm as compared to the old system uh, with steam and pressure. Large return. So a very typical farm that I build today is 10,000 to 17,000 pounds a month output. Takes about four weeks to produce that with a staff of four or five people. So with conventional mushroom farming, we have a few problems. It's high cost to build. You know, this is an autoclave that I designed and had built a few years back. Obviously, this is a lot of money, you know. It's a nice system, but bulk sterilization in large autoclaves with steam has become almost prohibitively expensive today, both for the equipment and the energy costs. The other one is inconsistent yields. We all know what inconsistent fruiting looks like. Low biological efficiency because of contamination. So for those not familiar with the term BE, uh, biological efficiency is the ratio of your raw material substrate going in to the fresh mushrooms coming out. So if you start with a thousand pounds of dry sawdust, let's say, and you end up with a thousand pounds of fresh mushrooms, that's a hundred percent BE. And really a hundred percent BE should be your, your absolute minimum. That's kind of your break even for almost any farm. You have to get a hundred percent BE. So these cold systems that I've been building over the last few years average about 175% BE. Also, look at the quality. It's beautiful. We've never seen mushrooms of this quality. you got good heavy stems so they don't dry out. The, the caps are tight and small. And every cluster weighs exactly the same. It's a completely controllable system. The other one is the timing of the fruiting. Controlling your farm has to do with harvest. And so mushrooms fruit over a bell curve of time. So you've got your first flush that starts and your second flush comes in. Well, if you've got fruiting on a bell curve, you're, you have to harvest every day. You're continuously harvesting. It's not terribly efficient. Whereas the cold system farms that we set up, they have very discrete flushes. We colonize for a period of time, then we put them into fruiting, and we pick everything on one day. There's a pause, we pick everything in the second flush, one day. Makes uh, farm control real easy. So really what we have done with the cold system, I'm going to show you some videos here in a second. Uh, we've transformed from an agricultural model to a biological manufacturing system, combining modern sterile tissue culture with uh, traditional agriculture. We have the highest yields and the lowest costs and the highest efficiency mushroom cultivation that the world has ever known. And the average size is usually about, um, well, I did this particular slide for a presentation in Europe. Uh, typically it's about 5,000 square feet, which will give you 10,000 to 17,000 pounds a month of mushrooms. The design is really a critical consideration. The workflow and the material flow in the facility and, and the airflow. So five steps, really. Substrate preparation and sterilization. This is true whatever method you're using. Column filling, inoculation, and compression, or bag filling, or jars, or whatever you're growing in. And then you control your colonization period by keeping high CO2. You control your fruiting period by dropping the CO2. Then it's 
such as harvesting and marketing. So first, substrate prep and sterilization. Basically, the finer your substrate is, the higher your yield is going to be, and the more tightly compressed it is. So we use uh, repurposed shipping totes. These work just about ideal for us. We can put about 150 pounds of dry weight straw in one of these, and we'll soak it in a solution to both hydrate it and sterilize it. Here's a farm we built up in Canada, soaking the substrate. We also uh, sometimes set up a shower system like this. This system was in Israel, or is in Israel, and we load these tanks with the substrate, and then we recirculate water from the pump. Here's a small system a guy set up in California. This way there's no wasted water at all. Any water uh, that is left over that doesn't soak into the straw just goes back to the tank. And there's several ways that we sterilize it. Uh, chlorine is a beautiful sterilant. There's processes that we've developed and methods for using chlorine uh, and then neutralizing it before we inoculate. What's more common is to use hydrated lime for those species that will handle a high pH. And uh, lignin is the polymer that uh, is, is what makes a tree stand up, basically. The cell wall of plants is made of cellulose, and the cellulose bundles are wrapped in lignin, which is a very complex, stable uh, polymer, which is very difficult to break down. Only the white rot fungi oxidize lignin, oysters, shiitakes, lion's mane, things like that. Well, chlorine and hydrated lime both break down lignin, which means that the mushroom can get to the food source quicker. Another good sterilant actually is wood ashes. Uh, wood ashes uh, we use quite a bit in Africa and Central America and places where ashes are available. But ashes make a very good sterilant. The importance of quality spawn can't be overemphasized. I mean, everything derives from the spawn. In this system, we use about two and a half percent spawn rate. So, ten pounds a bag, a ten pound bag of spawn is enough for about four hundred pounds of substrate. Here's a little video. This is sort of the first step after the sterilization. This is where we are using a winch to hoist the substrate out of the soaking container, out of the tote. We call this a tea bag. This holds about, wet weight about 600 pounds. And here's another system. This farm is in Utah. Uh, same thing, a little bit different tea bag. They built a steel frame for theirs. And it works straight out of the tea bag and goes from there into a mold to make the columns. So this mold and hand truck assembly is a critical part of the, of the system. These two halves bolt together and become a mold, which we can compress the substrate into with an air cylinder. And then afterwards, we unbuckle the two halves, and part of it becomes a hand truck to move the columns around. Here's a, here's a picture of it in operation. It's real simple. You take a little bit of the substrate and drop it down the hole and a sprinkle of spawn. substrate, a little bit of spawn, and this goes pretty quick. We build a column in under five minutes, and then this is a critical part here. We use an air cylinder and a foot pedal, and we will compress this column. The more tightly it's compressed, the faster it grows and the better the yield. There's a special locking ring we've developed to hold this uh, bag in place. Uh, that was a development. In the early days, we had trouble holding the bags in place while we were compressing them without ripping the bags or pulling them out. So uh, this has gone through a lot of evolution. We've worked out the details on that. This is our current version here. We cast in place with rubber, and this works real well. So. The column filling, inoculation, and compression is all done at this work stand. And the compression is critical. We're always working under HEPA filters, so the inoculation
calculator, as you can see in every case, is uh, dressed in a sterile manner and is working in a sterile air downdraft. So the whole key here is everything is done sterilely. And what we're doing is we're building synthetic logs. That's a good picture of it right there. These are tightly compressed synthetic logs made out of a cellulose material. In these photographs, this is straw, but it could be sawdust, it could be bagasse, it could be many other types of uh, cellulose material. Basically, anything that was once alive is good for a substrate. So, a little uh, video here of how we handle it post compression. We'll put a ring on there and some, and some zip ties. And this comes out of the uh, inoculation room. So now we have a, a handle. It sets right onto a pivot to make picking that column up. This just becomes a one-man operation. And we'll hang those on chains. Actually, the chain is just to keep it upright. The weight itself is sitting on the floor. You'll see that by the end of the day, this whole room is just a forest of uh, synthetic logs. Each one is six feet tall, 10 inches in diameter, and it weighs 100 pounds. And it goes through a period of roughly 21 days for colonization where we hold high CO2. And these are beautiful, perfectly colonized. These are about as ideal as they get. We've got 100 pounds of colonized substrate there. And at some point, they're ready to fruit. And you'll see pinning all over the surface like this. Typically, we'll get around 250 clusters per column. And then we shift those into specially designed grow rooms where we can control are four parameters, temperature, moisture, CO2, and light. And one of the things that we do in between every batch is we use a gas sterilizer. We'll vaporize oh, chlorine or chlorhexidine or some other sterilant into the air, and this will sterilize every crack and crevice. The entire rooms are epoxy coated, as you can see. Up on the wall on the right, we've got a misting system. Use LED lighting, and the floors are white so that we get good light distribution, top to bottom, so that every call, every uh, cluster is the same color. And we also build different styles. We build containers and grow rooms. I mean, uh, grow rooms and containers quite often. This is a common way that farms use to expand their production. Once you have that inoculation station, you can just keep adding grow rooms. And for each inoculation station, we can grow up to about 30,000 pounds a month. And then they start to fruit. This is young ones just starting to develop. And every one of those clusters will come out identical, pretty much. Grow many different varieties. Here's some pink oysters. Um, this is one of my favorite strains here. This is a real good one. Nice, heavy, even consistent size, really easy to, to market because they look so nice and they're so exactly even. And we manage that fruiting with controlling the CO2. If you look at the material in the column here, what started out as straw, you can see is pretty heavily uh, myceliated at this point, not much straw left, and um, just makes beautiful mushrooms. This is all from this system. Every one of these was picked off a column. I just happened to be at one of the farms one day when they were picking. And uh, I don't like to grow different varieties in the same room, but it's how they were doing it. So these were all coming out of the same room. A number of different varieties here. Here's another farm doing all the yellows. And here's some more. You know, we can do many different species. Pretty much whatever you want to do. So typically, to get that kind of production, we have one day a week of inoculation, and we'll do about 80 columns a week, typically, 10-inch diameter, 
six feet tall, 100 pounds. Those will colonize for about 21 days, then we'll shift them into another uh, room or shift the air environment, doesn't matter which. So on day 24, we'll get 100% BE. If it's straw, it uh, saturates at 72% moisture, which means each column has 72 pounds of water and 28 pounds of dry weight nutrient. That means your 100% BE level would be 28 pounds per column. But typically we'll get around 45 pounds per column by the time it's done. And that takes about uh, almost 60 days. Cost, about 100,000 uh, 100, bucks in the U.S. I put a staff of five people here, but usually it's more like four people. And that is still about 100,000 bucks a month in mushrooms. It doesn't take long to get a complete return on investment. I want to talk about some other uh, breakthroughs that we've had, you know, some clean room tools uh, and equipment and processes, because this is where a lot of people kind of trip up because there's so much uh, advice on the internet that really comes from the hobbyist perspective from people who have no experience in commercial mushroom production. And when you look at books, the one thing that most people don't look at is what's the publication date, you know? If you're looking at a book that was written in the 80s or 90s, well, maybe it's not as uh, up to date as it could be. So here's a picture of the way I like to build uh, flow hoods. This is a standard HEPA fan and filter unit from the factory. And we just uh, build a little frame and hang it in a top-down airflow position. And we use uh, clear vinyl sheeting to close in the front and sides. And this just works ideally. And it's way cheaper than buying a, a professional hood and higher quality. So the one on the left here is a production hood. Uh, there's a cooling room on the other side of this wall, so we'll pass production bags through the window there. They get inoculated and heat sealed, and they go back through the window to the other side. And the other smaller hood on the right is for working cultures. So I want to show you proper suiting techniques. This is some place that most people fall down. Let's see. Ninety percent of all of the organisms in a room are within one foot of the floor. And so the first step is you always make sure that you have fresh sterilant uh, in your foot tray. If you take care of the floor, you've knocked down 90% of your potential problems. The next step is you spray the floor off really well with a sterilant solution. In this case, we're using chlorhexidine. The reason for this is it's impossible to put on a suit without dragging it on the floor. So you don't want to contaminate your clean room suit before you ever get into the clean room. Suiting is always done in an airlock such as this. This is a, an airlock which is adjacent to the clean room uh, complex. And the air pressure from the clean room is flowing through this room. So we have clean air in this room. But, of course, it's not as clean as a real clean room. So all of the suits, gloves, booties, hoods, everything are kept in sealed plastic containers so they're not contaminated as they sit on the shelf. Uh, even better than this would be if the suits were individually packaged in plastic bags. Now, you can buy sterile clean room suits from any of the scientific suppliers like VWR but it's really not necessary. With our modern manufacturing techniques, uh, human hands have never touched these suits. And so what we do is we buy relatively cheap paper suits. These are about $2 or $3 a piece. Uh, they're available online from companies like Websterant. And as soon as the box is opened, they're put directly into these clean, sterilized plastic containers, and the lids are always kept on the container so that we're not collecting dust and other organisms on the suits themselves. So the correct uh, procedure would be to put your suit on first, you 
noticed how unavoidably the legs dragged across the floor, but that's okay because we uh, sprayed it down with a sterile. Now, putting a hair net underneath the hood is optional. Uh, it's a good idea because oftentimes you'll get so hot in the clean room in these suits that you'll be tempted to take that hood down. And if you've got a, a hair net underneath, it's not such a big deal. Your gloves get pulled up over the sleeves. You like to use a, a long cuff glove. These are Ansel Nitro Lab gloves, a 12 inch size. That gives you enough cuff length to cover your sleeves. That joint between the bottom of the sleeve and the top of the glove is one of the main, uh, main routes of contamination. As your sleeve pulls up and your glove pulls down, you'll be shedding bacteria and skin cells right from that area. So we put the, the cuffs up over the sleeve and then tape them in place. That's an important step right there. You don't want that wrist joint to be exposed to the clean air in the, uh, in the inoculation hood when you're working in the clean room. What we're trying to do here is isolate that personnel from the air supply in the lab. You're going to find also that the legs tend to be pretty baggy, so if you throw a piece of tape around your ankles, that keeps you from tripping over the, the foot part of that suit. See, that'll keep your, your foot section nice and tight. And here we go. Fully suited, ready to go in the clean room. Now, another important step. Spray down the bottom half of your body. Remember, we drug that on the floor. Yes, we had already sprayed the floor off, but you know nothing's 100% effective. So we'll be uh, using sterilant on our hands and arms and chest when we sit down at the hood in the clean room. But that's it. That's the correct method for suiting up. So I hope that that little video helped. That's one of the things I use for training all of my people. Now we're all suited up and we're in the lab and we're going to see some techniques uh, in the hood itself. You're going to be using sterilant constantly. This is a bleach bottle, but you notice we have three different sterilant bottles there. I've got alcohol, I've got bleach, I've got chlorhexidine. doesn't matter which ones you use as long as you're rotating your sterilants. I had soaked the handle end of my extended scalpels. Now I'm going to talk more about those scalpels in a minute. But you notice I have several scalpels in a jar. It's an interesting way to do it. What's that in my jar? Well, that's a bleach solution. Why? Well, you're going to see. One of the handiest tools that you can have are the extended scalpels and this device here. This is something that we evolved over a lot of years when I was running Aloha Medicinals. Liquid inoculation has some advantages, and the way it's typically done, where you're growing your culture out in liquid, oh man, that has some significant disadvantages. There is a reason that that type of liquid inoculation is not used anywhere in commercial production. And that reason is because you have no visual quality control potential. If you're growing a culture, you don't know whether it's a pure culture by looking at it. So what we have developed instead is we modify these blenders and we make a special blender lid setup, as you see here. The blender mechanism is right in the lid of a jar. Now we can sterilize just a bottle of water, or more typically it'll be a bottle of like a malt uh, yeast broth, just like you do malt yeast auger but with no auger in it. But even just Sterile water, doesn't matter. Put three quarters of a bottle of water there, sterilize it in the autoclave or your pressure cooker. And then you pick out your best looking Petri dishes. By using a Petri dish, you have a chance of doing visual quality control. The 
petri dish is growing in two dimensions so you can clearly see whether it's a clean culture if you got anything else in there and then we'll give it a few seconds on the blender and what this does is it makes a cell slurry we're chopping that up into little chunks we have a slurry of cellular material there so now when you use this to inoculate your jars or your bags <clears throat> a couple of things you're getting many many points of inoculation which is good and your first shake doesn't become nearly as important because as that liquid trickles down through there you're going to have a, a very good distribution of your inoculum I'm going to show you that again this is an actual production day I just filmed it as we were working one day you notice here I've got several scalpels in a jar next to the back decinerator again so pull one out put it in the back decinerator what we do is we'll store those three uh, scalpels in a jar with some uh, usually bleach solution you can use alcohol you can use different things and they're going to be in that solution they're going to have a reside time of, time of a few minutes and that's going to chemically sterilize them and then when we put them in the back decinerator they go through a second sterilization step where we're heat sterilizing them so we've picked out our best looking petri dishes in this case we're using a morel culture doing some liquid culture of morels and we'll take that right out of the petri dish into the jar you see very easy simple process there we go we've been using this method for a long time 10 or 12 years and uh, this will knock about a month off of your production time and for many species so we'll give it a whirl how long you blend it just depends on the culture some of them are tougher than others but uh, mushroom consulting makes these blender setups and makes a scalpel kits as well so you can always go to mushroom-consulting.com uh, to see more about this equipment this is a very good method. Now this jar is ready to inoculate about 20 or 25 bags. So you could do 250 pounds of uh, substrate with one petri dish. And this is the other thing that you're going to really be happy with once you do it. If you're working with a back decinerator, you know, we've all burned our hands, right? Scalpel handles get hot. So we make an extended handle insulated color coded scalpels why color coded remember i said we'll throw about three scalpels in the jar well if they're all the same color as in my how i usually end up doing it uh, you never know which one you're picking up so this way let's say you use the red scalpel and you put it back in the jar you don't want to grab that same scalpel again because it takes a little time to reside in that bleach solution for it to become truly sterile so next time you'll use the yellow one and uh, by the time you get it back around to using the red one again it's been in there five or ten minutes so you know that you've gotten real sterility out of it anyways if you're interested in learning more about this it's mushroom-consulting.com uh, we do all sorts of um, consulting work in the mushroom industry uh, we design and build farms build custom equipment so I hope you've gotten some good information out of this and happy shrooming